Top Democrat aimed at putting pressure on President Trump's plans on immigration as we go outnumbered overtime. I'm Harris Faulkner. The White House is calling it outrageous that a federal judge has temporarily blocked President Trump's decision to end the Obama era Dreamers program. The ruling by the San Francisco based judge, coming just hours after President Trump hosted a bipartisan group of lawmakers to hammer out an immigration deal. The president insists that any deal must include his border wall. Homeland Security Chief Kirsten Nielsen was in the, the room yesterday. Passion for the DACA recipients. He's been clear on that. He wants to find a permanent fix, but he's also very clear that the way to do that is we must increase border security and close the loopholes so that we don't end up here again in two, three years with another population that we're concerned about. The wall works. We have evidence and figures that show that. When the wall went up in Yuma and San Diego, the illegal entries went down 95 percent. Uh, and I, I must uh, remind uh, the viewers that in 2006, it was a bipartisan approach uh, to securing our country. And it's not just DACA on the president's plate, but a looming deadline on the Iran deal, the nuclear deal, and even the Russia investigation. We have a powerful lineup to weigh in. White House spokesperson Hogan Gidley, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Senator Rand Paul will join us, and Congressman Jim Jordan. Let's first start with Anita Vogel in Los Angeles on the controversial Dreamers ruling. Anita? Well, hi there, Harris. The lawsuit before the Ninth Circuit was brought by the state of California along with the University of California and others. It extends protection for the children of illegal immigrants who were brought to the U.S. before the age of 16. California is home to the largest group of DACA recipients, some 200,000 people. And leading the charge for their protection was California's Attorney General, Javier Becerra, who you might consider to be the face of the resistance movement here in California. He reacted to the ruling just moments ago. This is a huge step forward, but the fight is not over. I've said from the very beginning that DACA was fully legal. Now I'm more convinced that the courts will find that what Donald Trump and his administration did was not legal. But the injunction by the Ninth Circuit is only temporary, and ultimately Congress will have to come up with some kind of a compromise solution. Yesterday in that long, televised White House meeting, the president said he's in favor of a DACA deal as long as he gets his funding for the border wall. And today, dreamers and legal immigrants from around the country are reacting to the Ninth Circuit ruling. A lot of those DACA recipients are starting to feel like a pop in this whole political uh, arena and we've been a palm for a very long time and it's not just for the democrats it's also have been for the republicans i think uh, daca discriminates against legal immigrants there's a lot of people who are here legally not breaking the law also just this morning president trump tweeted about the daca decision saying quote it just shows everyone how broken and unfair our court system is when the opposing side in a case such as daca always runs to the ninth circuit and almost always wins before being reversed by higher courts now the president clearly referring to his travel ban which the ninth circuit ruled against many times but ironically enough, it was a previous tweet by the president that the judge in this case, William Alsop of the Ninth Circuit, referred to in his ruling yesterday on DACA. This tweet from September 14th, when the president said, quote, does anybody really want to throw out good, educated, and accomplished young people who have jobs serving in the military? Really? Under this ruling, DACA recipients will be allowed to renew their status, although the government will not be required to accept new applications or allow DREAMers to return to the U.S. if they leave. Harris. Anita, thank you very much. Let's get now reaction from the White House to the judge's ruling. We're joined by Deputy White House Press Secretary Hogan Gidley. Hogan, thanks for being here today. So the president calling it a broken uh, and unfair system, pointing to activist judges. Why does he put it that way? Because these judges clearly are trying to legislate from the bench. We're a nation of laws. We believe that this judge has acted unconstitutionally. We also believe that President Barack Obama completely ignored the law, ignored the Constitution uh, when he tried to protect DACA recipients. The president has urged Congress to take care of this. This is where it should be handled. It should be codified into law. The president will work with Congress to make sure something is, is, is done that is constitutional, but also puts the interests of the American people first. That's what this president is all about. 
Hogan, uh, at a moment that the president has even continued talking about today, quite proud of that long bipartisan meeting put on display for the world to see as he let the cameras stay for an extended period of time inside the cabinet room. What does this judge's ruling, Hogan, mean for the immigration negotiations? I don't know that it affects the uh, negotiations too much. I mean, look, the president was very clear in that meeting that he wants responsible immigration reform, as I just mentioned, that puts the interests of the American people first. Our current system doesn't do that. In fact, uh, when they came out of the meeting, both Republicans and Democrats and the president uh, helped narrow down the negotiations to really four main areas, and that included border security first. We have to secure the border. That is tantamount and paramount to what the president wants to accomplish. We also have to fix chain migration and also the visa lottery system, and then we'll talk about DACA as well. Those are all the four points that the two sides agreed upon. That's the negotiating table that's been set, and that's where the president wants to lead this country. Now, Hogan, you can't deny the point, though, that this puts pressure on the, on the president's plans. I mean, to have a judge act in this way. So what should we look uh, from the, the Justice Department next? This has happened before, but I mean, you have to ask the Justice Department what they're going to do on the, on the issue. They issued a statement similar to ours this morning, but it doesn't deter what the president wants to do. In fact, he's more determined than ever. These things have to be fixed. Uh, they've been ignored for far too long. Uh, we've seen the dangers that have occurred attached to chain migration and also the visa lottery program with two recent terrorist attacks. The president believes not only the facts are on his side, the American people are on his side, but the Constitution is on his side as well. Does the White House think, does the president think that this will get done by next Friday, January 19th. Uh, I'm not sure when, the, when we believe it's going to get done. We just know it has to get done because the American people's lives are at risk here. The safety of this country is at risk. And that's the, the, the first and foremost what the president, uh, his role is to do is to protect the American people. And I bring up that date, as you well know, Hogan, because it's the date that you must negotiate a government spending bill to keep the government open. The true date for dreamers, of course, is in March. But because Democrats right. are attaching this to what they want to see as movement with spending, that's why it's up now. Your last thought on this and then we're going to move on. Absolutely. They're trying to attach it. But look, Chuck and Nancy both demanded clean spending bills, clean budget bills in the past. Now they're going back on their own rule, the Chuck and Nancy rule, which was to pass clean bills uh, as it relates to spending. We have to fund the military first and foremost. That's what this budget does. We want it clean. We don't want to attach any of the president's plans to it. We don't. We expect Democrats to do the same thing and not attach any of their plans to it as well and abide by the own rules that they set forth in the past. All right. This has happened, and I know many Republicans are going after uh, California Senator Dianne Feinstein for releasing Fusion GPS t testimony. Fusion GPS, of course, that company that put together the anti-Trump dossier. She did this unilaterally on her own. Uh, we know Senator Chuck Grassley is not happy about that. Uh, what says the White House? Well, look, it's it's kind of laughable here. I mean, the the, the for Senator D Dianne Feinstein to do this uh, under the guise of transparency, we want the facts to get out. But so much of the report is redacted. It's just absolutely not uh, absolute nonsense. But look, the media continues to be distracted by tabloid trash books and this type of uh, unsubstantiated uh, dossier that even Senator Feinstein said that there was no collusion uh, with Russia and and this president. But moving forward in this, uh, we realize that uh, the media will be distracted, but this president won't be distracted. In fact, uh, in the face of all of these things, he, set, uh, he has record-setting accomplishments in record-setting time. Now, as you just pointed out, we're moving mm -hmm. forward, trying to protect the American people, do something about immigration, but also focus on infrastructure, which was the subject of the cabinet meeting just now behind my shoulders here. So this president is not going to be deterred by simple petty politics uh, by Senator Dianne Feinstein. Well, and from what I'm reading, and we'll talk with Representative Jim Jordan about this more just moments from now, now, Hogan, is, is that we want to just find out how this actually uh, impairs or, or affects the investigation. So I'll ask him that question and move on now to Steve Bannon with you. I, I'm curious to know what the president has to say about Bannon stepping down from Breitbart. I don't know that we have a comment about him stepping down uh, from Breitbart. That's his decision. But I did see the comment where Steve Bannon made the point that he'll resurface again when the president needs him. Look, the president didn't need him uh, when he beat 16 Republican candidates, probably the most accomplished in, uh, in history. He defeated him without Steve Bannon's help. We passed tax reform without Steve Bannon's help. Uh, the president was able to cut regulations without Steve Bannon's help. If anybody in this situation needs help, it's Steve Bannon because he needs help finding a job. 
Wow. A uh, political operation in 2018 is what his job is going to be, according to Steve Bannon. Last word on this. Do you see yourselves in the White House or this administration running oppositional to anything that Steve Bannon would put together? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure what the future will bring. I'll just say if Steve Bannon's political operation is, uh, is as effective as it was in Alabama, then uh, he's going to be looking for more than a job. You are not mincing words. Hogan Gidley from the White House, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Meanwhile, Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley speaking out against the committee's ranking Democrat, Senator Dianne Feinstein. Remember, I said I was going to go deeper on this with our next guest for releasing Glenn Simpson's testimony. Obviously, I was a little disappointed because I had an understanding ahead of time that it'd be released when we both agreed to release it. And I think I've shown my cooperation with uh, the other side uh, by yet just yesterday uh, agreeing to two interviews that they want of their, at their request. And so I think we're going to move forward without any uh, glitch uh, in the way we've been operating. Well, here's what Senator Feinstein said in a statement, quote, the innuendo and misinformation circulating about the transcript are part of a deeply troubling effort to undermine the investigation into potential collusion and obstruction of justice. The only way to set the record straight is to make the transcript public. Republican Jim Jordan sits on the House Judiciary Committee and Oversight Committees. So what was your first reaction when you learned this? Well, I mean, it is what it is. It's out there. Uh, as I looked at it, it seems to me to confirm that the FBI was telling Christopher Steele, first, that there was an investigation going on, and second, what is the FBI telling Christopher Steele, the author of the dossier, paid for by the Democrat National Committee and the Clinton campaign, what is the FBI doing telling him that there's supposedly some second source at, at, for, for information about the Russia investigation? So that's troubling. And then when you take what you learn from that and couple it with the story yesterday from John Solomon in the Hill, where he talks about more text messages from Peter Strzok and Lisa Page mm -hmm. that highlight they were leaking things to the press to further their narrative, to accomplish their plan, I think all that together yesterday just confirms what we suspected. Top people at the FBI look like they had a plan to undermine the Trump campaign. So by releasing this by Dianne Feinstein, unilaterally, on her own, she didn't check with anybody else that we know yeah. on the committee, she, she goes ahead and does this. What impact does this have on the overall investigation? I don't think a, a great deal. I mean, it would have been nice if they would have done it together, as Mr. Grassley, uh, Chairman Grassley pointed out. But it is what it is. Uh, it's not the first time someone in Washington has done something on their own, leaked some information. But what I look at is what did we learn from it? And we learned something that should not happen. The FBI was telling Christopher Steele there was an investigation. The uh -huh. FBI, sh uh, sh according to Glenn Simpson's testimony, the FBI shared with Christopher Steele, again, the author of the dossier, shared with Christopher Steele the fact that there was supposedly some second source. Who that is, we're not sure. You know, it's interesting. What I'm learning from you now is, okay, let's just let this sit out there, but let's take a closer look and look at what we can learn from it. What are the types of gaps that you think you can fill in from this Fusion GPS transcript? Yeah, I think it only confirmed what we, th what, what, what we thought and what I said earlier, that there was a, remember the one text message between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page? We, they said, we need an insurance policy. We need a plan to make sure the American people don't elect Donald Trump as the next president. What was part of that plan? I think it was using Christopher Steele's work product, the dossier, as the basis to go to the FISA court and get warrants to spy on Americans. And I think it was also part of their plan to take information leak it to the press to further their narrative and further their plan, almost this self-fulfilling prophecy kind of thing yeah. that they were engaged in. That all was confirmed in this, this, this uh, Simpson testimony, coupled with, again, what we've learned now in the additional text messages that are coming to light, yeah. as evidenced by the reporting of John Solomon yesterday. You know, the one unfortunate thing with the release, though, and, and I don't know how hard you'll press to get uh, Glenn Simpson, but you do want to get him, you do want to hear from him. Does this give him a way of saying, no, you've got my transcripts, you don't get anything else from me? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, if, if, if there needs to be further, uh, further interviews, further depositions, further questions, Questions. I'm sure that will happen at the appropriate time. But I want to talk to Peter Strzok. I want to talk to Lisa Page. I want to talk to uh, FBI general counsel. Used to be general counsel. He's been demoted. Uh, Jim mm -hmm. Baker. I want to talk to all those people at the at the FBI. The top people, the FBI, uh, uh, who who I think orchestrated this whole affair. Before I let you go, Congressman Jordan. At the end of the day, what what is the penalty? What is the accountability here? I mean, you you find out that potentially there's bias at the FBI, and what happens? 
Well, first of all, you got to get all the answers. You got to get the answers to the important questions. You got to bring that 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 public, and then and then see. Maybe there maybe there will be uh, finally a second uh, special counsel appointed by Jeff Sessions. Maybe we will have to have criminal referrals, as Mr. Graham mm. and Senator Grassley did last week for Christopher Steele. We don't know, but we can't get to that point if we first don't get the information. The appropriate documents, information, and access to the witnesses who need to be deposed and who need to be questioned. To Diane Feinstein, then maybe do you a favor. At least this is out there. I don't think it's that harmful, frankly. And as I said, I think it kind of confirms some of the things we mm -hmm. already suspected and where the evidence is all pointing. Congressman Jim Jordan, great to see you. Thank you very you much. We just briefly talked about it. Steve Bannon out at Breitbart News. In the wake of a very public feud with President Trump, will the former chief strategist? remain an influential political voice with the midterm elections looming. And for whom? Which candidates will jump on board with him? We'll go in depth. And House lawmakers weighing whether to renew a controversial surveillance program the Trump administration says will help protect our nation. But some lawmakers say it needs better oversight to protect Americans' privacy. Senator Rand Paul says he's going to filibuster and he'll give us his take. The thing is, is when you gather information from foreigners in foreign lands without the Constitution, that information is not gathered with constitutional protections and should never be used against Americans. This is a bedrock principle of our country. Deep dive now on this alert. Steve Bannon stepping down from his top post at Breitbart News amid tensions with the White House, specifically the president. In his rec resignation statement, Steve Bannon said, quote, I'm proud of the work the Breitbart team has accomplished in so short a period of time in building out a world-class news platform, end quote. Meanwhile, the Washington Post is reporting Steve Bannon told associates he plans to focus on creating a political operation in 2018 and that he predicts Trump, the president, I would say, will need to help uh, from him again in the future once Republican leaders desert the president. Joining me now is Michael Blake, vice chair of the Democratic National Committee. Kaylee McEnany is an RNC spokesperson as well and author of the new book, The New American Revolution, The Making of the Populist Movement. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Michael, great to see you. Great to All see right. You. So, uh, Kaylee, what is this going to look like? A brand new operation by Steve Bannon. Well, I don't imagine it will be very successful, Harris. You know, this book I wrote about the election, 321 pages, not one mention of Steve Bannon, because when I traveled the country talking to Americans, they were not excited about Steve Bannon. They were excited about President Donald Trump. And I know some in the mainstream media are concerned about finding the mastermind behind President Trump. President Trump is his own mastermind. The base is energized solely and exclusively by him. All right. You know, it's interesting when I look at the situation and I think of people kind of going rogue. One name that pops up is the former DNC chair, uh, Donna Brazil. And so in some ways you have seen a little bit of something like this, Michael, uh, on your side of the political aisle. What do you make of it? We haven't seen anything like this where you had the, the master mind of the political operation uh, going against the sitting president and them essentially attacking each other. We have not seen a scenario where you have a, a tell-all author talking about on-the-record conversations happening in the White House. Uh, however, what we want to actually focus on is what's not happening. The more we're talking about this, the less we're talking about why hasn't Chip been exercised and continued. Well, what are we doing to make sure that federal government is actually getting the funding that they need? That's what we have to be focused on rather than the distractions on happening in this conversation. The child health care insurance program is what you're talking about. But you know, you say that directly to me, but I, I think Kaylee probably wants to talk directly to you about what you just said. Right. You know, the Republican Party, it's no secret we had our divisions leading up to the election of Donald Trump. But when you looked, Harris, just two weeks ago at the Rose Garden ceremony of tax cuts, you had Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump and all stripes of our party standing together unified. Meanwhile, Democrats, there was a Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders running against the establishment Hillary Clinton. The DNC was in the tank for Hillary. We now know that. There are deep wounds and divisions in the Democratic Party. Steve Bannon's of no moment to Republicans, but the DNC has a lot to answer for, for why they propped up Clinton at the expense of Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders. Look you're, no you're farther probably right. than the recent award show when Oprah popped up and every Democrat that I have talked with has said, okay, yeah, fine for her, but we probably want to get somebody who's a politician. 
Well, let's talk about the elections. I mean, I'm happy to focus on that since Kaylee's bringing that up. We could talk about how we won in Alabama. We could talk about how we won in Virginia, which was being communicated that we would lose that race. We can talk about how we've had races won all across the country. So clearly we're doing something right at the DNC and across the Democratic partners. If we want to talk about what the Republicans should be focusing on, it's what are you going to be doing in Arizona now that you have Joe Arpaio saying that he's going to be running for the United States Senate. So there are things that we should be focusing on in the immediate. How do we make sure people get jobs? How do you make sure people get health care and to make it seem as if the RNC and others are not talking about what's happening. Yes, you could talk about what occurred at, at the Rose Garden, uh, an effort where a tax plan that over the long term, 70 percent of Americans will see their taxes go up. That comes from a nonpartisan institute. And the Tax Policy Center, by the way, which is left leaning, says 80 percent of Americans will see a tax cut. And Next that, year well, alone, no, This long year, long starting, yeah. starting well, in on, February, you know, we have a, an agenda of success, of record achievement, record rescinding of regulations under Donald Trump, record acceptance and confirmation of, of circuit court judges, tax cuts like we haven't seen in 30 years. Democrats, you have negativity, you have Russian collusion, and ludicrous arguments about mental fitness. My, meanwhile, we have bipartisan success, as we saw at the meeting yesterday, a president who wants to bring you the party together. I mean, a success I, I, I where do, you just had I, a judge say that you're going to block DACA because it's an unconstitutional ban. So again, we won't talk about success. Let's talk about the you track record. You do realize there having. are four Republicans whom the president has been touting, and we can talk about it, that the bill is coming out to Today on immigration uh, reform, uh, and it looks directly at where Democrats said that they they wanted to focus, and that's DACA and the Dreamers. I mean, it will be woefully sad for Democrats, for lack of a better word, um, if you guys are not at the table when these decisions are being made. So you know, there was an opportunity yesterday. Some of of the Democrats took it to talk about these issues. I want to talk about money though, because I saw some some fundraising numbers that I, I mean. I'm curious to know, Kaylee, you guys are raking in the cash and how the Democrats are going to answer back, first of all. Right. We've raised, I, I love my DNC counterpart here, but we've raised double that the DNC has. We have seven times cash on hand advantage. And what's so impressive, Harris, is a record number of small donations, people pulling out their wallets, everyday Americans, and filling the coffers at the RNC because of enthusiasm for Donald Trump. Democrats are going to have a hard map ahead. So where, why is there a gap in, in cash for the Democrats right now? Well, in large part because you have Larger donors that give to the Republican Party, but let's stay focused on this. Wait a minute. Uh, again, again, that's You've just. You've got some big donors. Yeah, yeah, Come on. 98% of direct Harris, contributions Harris, are small donors. I think donors. sometimes, Harris, you, you missed the point that I just conveyed. I said there are larger donors. I didn't say we don't have large donors. Number two, again, we want to talk about the facts. In 2006, the RNC outraised the DNC two to one, and what do we know happened there? We took back the majority. So it's about do you have the resources to actually win? It's not just about the large donors. Number three, you actually said something that was inaccurate earlier. You said that we're not at the table when it comes to DACA and what's happening. Happening on the conversations. We have been engaged, but we have said repeatedly it should be, this should be focused purely on DACA, not around what's being proposed. Wait, Mike, so. Harris, is, conversation Harris is right to say you're not engaged. When I watched that bipartisan meeting yesterday, I saw Trump wanting a permanent fix. Remember, Obama uh, did, had an unconstitutional fix with that executive order for DACA and put these people in this situation. And let's not forget yesterday, Dianne Feinstein saying, We've tried this before, it didn't work. You used to be the party of yes, we can under Obama, now it's no, we won't. All right, we're going to bring you back. Michael, Kaylee, wow, thank you. Thank you. All right, Always we'll good. move thank on. You. A group of House Republicans are about to release their own immigration bill. I just said it. And how it may square with what was decided in the White House meeting yesterday. Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy was in that room, and now he'll be on overtime. Stay close. Fox's alert, a group of House Republicans are expected to release an immigration bill within hours. Just a day after President Trump hosted a bipartisan meeting at the White House to talk about immigration reform, the bill will reportedly offer legal status to dreamers, immigrants brought here illegally as children, but will also include several measures Democrats have already rejected, such as penalties for sanctuary cities. I'm joined now by Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, a Republican from California. He was at that meeting at the White House. His first time on Outnumbered Overtime. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, thanks for having my inaugural opportunity here. Absolutely. Let's talk first about where we are with regard to the bill that's coming later today. Uh, we're starting to get some dribs and drabs, but I know you say it fits into an overall view, but first, the Goodlatte bill and the other three that are expected to come out. Well, Chairman Goodlatte, uh, Chairman of Judiciary, this is what he's been working on for quite some time. And remember, the Democrats have kind of drugged their feet thinking DACA just by itself to be able to pass. 
Well, if you do that, you're going to be right back at this problem next year as well. So you've got to have border security. We've got to do something about chain migration when you look at the uh, bomber just in New York a couple months ago. And then the lottery system of changing that into a merit system of how it's based. But the bill by Chairman Goodlatte goes much further, deals with sanctuary cities, which we passed off this floor. Kate's law, which we passed off this floor, too, is inside there. And then he goes into also about guest workers, E-Verify, and some other things. So it's a much broader immigration reform bill, but mm -hmm. it also deals with DACA as well. And I said the other three, I want to be fair, Representatives Labrador, McCall, and McSally are also with the Chairman yeah. Goodlatte on this bill. So talk to me just about where the president was uh, toward the end of that meeting that we got to see before the reporters were booted out, but it was a lot to take in 55 minutes live. Um, where was the president finally in the idea of what will be talked about uh, before next Friday, the government shutdown date, the deadline, January 19th, in terms of immigration? What will be included? Well, the president was exactly at the end of the meeting where he was at the beginning. First of all, he said, we have a funding debate going on with our military, and we all know the challenges for our military and what's happening around the world. So what he asked is, let's not play politics with the military. Let's get our budget agreement and move forward with that. But to deal with DACA, because that's not till March, and with the recent court case, maybe that's a little later. But he says to deal with DACA, let's deal with four issues, and let's only talk about those four. And when the president refers to DACA, that's what he's talking about, dealing with DACA, dealing about border security, dealing about chain migration, um, and then dealing about the lottery system. Those are the four elements and principles, what we all agreed to in that room after, uh, at the end of the meeting, that that's where we would have our focus, that's where we'd have our discussions as we move forward. Um, the leaders in there, we will get together today and then we'll put that group back together hopefully tomorrow and the next day to continue our work to solve this problem. You know, as I looked at that meeting, it felt epic. And, and I was watching social media during it that people had never seen the curtain pulled back yeah. quite that way for that long. What was it like for you as you look back over your career? Well, you know, I've never been in a, I've been in a lot of meetings, but never sure. with the media right there. And normally what happens in a meeting like that, because the media wants to see what's happening, you bring them in for the beginning, which people say the spray, mm -hmm. where they would take a picture, take a little video, the, the president would make a comment. But this is what's so unique about this president. He wanted to make sure on a fair basis, and this all started when I was with at Camp David with him this week, and he was telling me how earlier last week he was with some Republican senators talking about DACA. They all agreed, but he said, we can't solve that unless we bring Democrats in the room too. So give him a lot of credit. He brought both sides both chambers and he's trying to use that what he's so good at at the art of the deal trying to get an agreement here and then he let the media just see it so the american public sure. and he, to me the okay well as sometimes can happen in live television you'll get a satellite freeze and unfortunately that has happened now with the majority leader kevin mccarthy we will bring him back as we can but we certainly wait we got him back look at you Wow, technology. No, it's, yes. it's, I was explaining to the audience, sometimes the satellite will freeze. has nothing to do generally with weather. It's just technology. And it seldom works out that you come back, but we're so grateful. All right, so <laughs> uh, to further this point, because we did see some contentious moments, which I think are valuable for the American public to see. We saw Cuellar of Texas with his charts and things. What was it like in those moments? Because sometimes you can shut a conversation down. Do you feel like you're moving forward? I felt that meeting was one of the most productive meetings. I'll tell you this, Congressman Cuellar, he just stopped me on the floor and said that was a great meeting. When can we meet again? And he was starting to think about those elements that we just talked about prior on mm -hmm. some ideas of where they can go. That is what the uniqueness of President Trump was able to do and what the American public should see. People do have different philosophies. They should be able to freely express them and their ideas. But this building and our, our country is based upon compromise. And that's what you're going to see at the end of the day. There's going to have to be compromise on both sides, but you're going to have to stick to the rule of law. Mm -hmm. and you're going to have to find where the common ground is. I hear the optimism in your voice, and I know the American public, no matter where you are in, in politics, it's great to see people working together. You know, there's hope moving forward. I want to ask you about this, though. This is breaking. Uh, Representative yes. Daryl Issa, 
um, also of your home state of California, has just announced that he is retiring. Uh, with that, that brings us to 46 representatives who are retiring or running for other office. 32 of them are Republicans. Uh, three senators are Republicans who are retiring. You've got um, kind of an institutional knowledge drain with, with chairmen leaving their offices or in Hatch in Utah, for example. How do you go forward in a midterm year and lead and get things done knowing that you've got some exit points of some pretty strong people in your party? Well, first of all, we'll finish out 20, 2018 very strong because they're not exiting. They got another year to go. So you have that brain power still here. But remember, one thing that Republicans do, we don't pick chairman based upon the not amount of years you served in Congress. It's your ability. And Chairman uh, Issa was already a chairman of oversight. He did a tremendous job there. He served here a number of years. He wants to go off and to do something else as well. He's been a very successful businessman. Same thing with uh, Mr. Royce. He, he's term limited as chairman. Uh -huh. And same thing with Schuster. So, yeah, are there more Republicans? Yes, because there's more Republican members. And a number of members who are departing, like Christy Nome, she's running mm -hmm. for governor of South Dakota. Yeah, other offices. Or you got Di yeah, Diane Black. So they're actually moving up. We will bring more people in. It'll be successful in that. And that's the uniqueness that we have. The competition makes even people better. Yeah, and one of the things I'm reading, too, is if you look statistically, you always lose some people along the way right after an election sometimes, other parts of the year, too. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, because Representative Issa has been very vocal on certain items, and just get your thoughts. So I appreciate that. Uh, Majority Leader, will you come back another time? I will gladly come back. We'll have the satellite complete for the whole time. Look at you. Just ruling it. <laughs> thank you. Happy New Year. All right. Thank you. The White House is weighing its options as some big deadlines are fast approaching for the Iran nuclear deal. Remember, recertification, that's the question. Whether President Trump will continue to waive sanctions and the potential impact of pulling out of that deal completely. Up next, Senator Rand Paul to talk about it all. Stay close. Well, it's about to get chippy, as we say in hockey, ahead of a House vote expected to come tomorrow on whether to reauthorize a controversial FISA surveillance program, allowing the government to surveil non-U.S. citizens abroad as part of counterterrorism measures. It expires January 19th. But today, a bipartisan group of House and Senate lawmakers are threatening to derail that bill unless protections are added for law-abiding Americans who get caught up in that surveillance. We understand that there are threats overseas, <coughs> foreign targets, people we have to be concerned about to protect the safety of the American people. What we're against is without a warrant having the communications of law-abiding Americans swept up in that process. Well, you saw a Democrat there. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul was also at that news conference today. And I know you say you're willing to filibuster that bill now. Uh, the senator is with us. Why? Well, you know, I think when we talk about the Bill of Rights, an integral part of our Constitution, it is worth filibustering. It's worth trying to say, you know what, we will have to obey the Bill of Rights. Americans need these protections. So, for example, this spy program is intended to spy on foreigners in foreign lands. I'm for it. It's a way to protect ourselves against enemies. However, as they spy on foreigners, they collect a lot of Americans. We're talking about millions of American phone calls and emails are in this database. Innocent Americans, they're incidentally collected. They're collected in sort of peripheral ways. They were never the target of anything, but they're in the database. The data is collected without any constitutional protections. I'm okay with that with foreigners, but for Americans, the Constitution always applies. I don't want domestic law enforcement searching this big database that's supposed to be on foreigners mm -hmm. and trying to accuse people of domestic crimes. I think the Constitution applies to everybody, every American here, and it is worth filibustering over. Yeah, so what you're saying is that we've agreed through our Constitution to lower the bar where foreigners have access to those rights, that's fine, but all of us have to be protected at a certain higher level. So the question then is, how do you, how do you change it and, and keep us safe at the same time? Because you do have, Senator, people arguing, well, we'll just give up some freedom so you can keep us <laughs> safe. <laughs> 
Well, the thing is, is that's what the terrorists are trying to take away from us, is our rule of law, our freedoms, our uh, American tr traditions of Bill of Rights. That's what we're fighting to preserve. So if we give up that because we're fearful of terrorists, mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, will it, have, will it have all been worthwhile, all the thousands of American soldiers who died to defend the Constitution? I think you can have both. I have no problem with spying on foreigners in foreign lands, and they don't get constitutional protections. Sure. But if you accidentally or incidentally gather up millions of Americans, here, here's an example. Right now, the Justice Department has decided they're going to go after medical marijuana in Colorado. Colorado has legalized this. We have this enormous database. Would you want the uh, U.S. government to be searching through a database on foreigners that's incidentally collecting information on Americans and then have the federal government go and try to overturn Colorado's law? So there's a lot of things that really should involve the Constitution. Any American accused of a crime deserves the Fourth Amendment, which says the government can't look at your stuff unless they have probable cause you've committed a crime, they have to name you, and they have to say what they're looking for. This information has been gathered with no constitutional protections. It's just all scarfed up by the millions and millions. And so we have to be very careful about letting the government just look at that without any kind of control. Well, your hallmark on Congress has been your ability to filibuster. So we look forward to seeing what you will say yeah. about this. Uh, it, it's an interesting point. I think, again, people are in that comfort zone if we just want to be safe. But what you're talking about, potentially, that can go wrong is very important for us to know about. Just before I let you go, and we don't have a lot of time, but I want to talk about the Iran nuke deal deadline that's approaching uh, and where you think we will be when that, that deadline gets here. You know, I think with the Iranian agreement, I had misgivings in the beginning because I was worried that we gave too much too early and whether or not they would continue to comply. But everything I've seen so far is that Iran has complied with the nuclear agreement, so I think we ought to keep it. They are not necessarily doing what we want on the ballistic side, developing conventional warfare, but that's not part of the agreement. So I'm a little different than some. Some people want to tear up the agreement. I think we should be actually negotiating a new agreement on ballistic missiles with them and trying to continue to engage. And I think ultimately the Iranian people, uh, once they see that we're not interested in invading their country, most mm. of the Iranian people would like mm -hmm. to oversee, like to see the Revolutionary Guard and the mullahs overthrown. But I think it could happen actually work the opposite direction if we begin destroying the agreements we have with You them. know, it's interesting what you say because it, it buys a little time to give that revolution, uh, which is what I call it, uh, a chance to take hold and, and move forward. That's an interesting perspective on it. So based on what you're saying, we might see the president recertify uh, and keep that in place uh, so that the conversation can continue there on the ground in Iran potentially. Uh, Senator Rand Paul, great to see you. Great to see you in good health and happy new year to you. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Perino, and Congressman Trey Gowdy joins us at the top of the hour to talk about the latest on the Trump dossier, as one conservative columnist calls all the spin on it silly and says everything should be released. Plus, Republicans encouraging a popular author to run for the Senate in Ohio. We'll tell you who that is. And 7-Eleven convenience stores becoming the latest front in the red-hot immigration battle. All that and more coming up on The Daily Briefing. Well, President Trump is appearing to blame the court system after a federal judge temporarily blocked his effort to shut down the Obama-era DACA program. I'm joined now by Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News senior judicial analyst. This has been a hot topic. We know that the president met bipartisan-wise uh, at the right. White House with leaders yesterday. And so we're talking all about dreamers. And the president now says that the opposing side, meaning Democrats, always like to run to the Ninth Circuit. Why? Well, he's right about the about those who want to challenge his use of executive authority like to run to the Ninth Circuit. Just by, by history and tradition, the Ninth Circuit has been the most liberal circuit in, in the federal system. There are 13 circuits. The Ninth Circuit is physically the largest. It's the 15 westernmost states in the United States. But it really depends upon where the first case is filed. Uh -huh. And the people who are challenging this, I'm going to give you the name of the person who challenged it in a second, filed it in California. Her name, Janet Napolitano. No relation. <laughs> but as the president of the University of California, she's arguing that the order she signed when she ran DHS in the Obama years should still be the law and not the Donald Trump version of it. Here's why President Trump should not be upset. Take Over, and let's slow down for a second because the people are just retuning in after going to get their Pepsi. 
or Coke. Um, the judge now wants to block the president being able to do what? The judge ordered, a federal judge in San Francisco late last night ordered that DACA stay in place until the conclusion, this is a preliminary ruling, it's not a final ruling, mm -hmm. until the conclusion of litigation that is in front of him or Congress rewrites the law, whichever happens first. So yesterday when President Trump met with all those people in the 55 minute captivating it was give epic. and take. Correct. Amazing. Correct. Senator Feinstein said, but Mr. President, DACA's gonna expire in a month and a half. We have to rule right away. Guess what? DACA just got a reprieve. DACA's gonna be there until June. So if the judge gives you a lemon, Mr. President, make lemonade. You now have, instead of 45 days, you now have five months in which to craft comprehensive immigration reform, and DACA stays in place during that five-month period. So why did the judge do this? Because he found that President Trump's statements in tweets and elsewhere like, I love the dreamers and want them to stay, was so inconsistent with what the Justice Department was arguing before him that the government is speaking out of both sides of his mouth, so he's going to hold everything in place until he can.